Oh, hey, we're here. Hello, everybody. My name is Lars Nelson. I'm here with Amanda Reyes, and this is the, uh, the latest, uh, it's the second chapter of our uh, tribute to Aaron Spelling, uh, Masters and Methods, Aaron Spelling. And what we did last time, some of you may have watched it, um, despite the efforts of uh, technology to try to keep this off the air, we made it. Uh, and we showed a couple of very early Aaron Spelling uh, television episodes, one from Burke's Law and one from a show called Honey West. And now we're moving into what was a really significant part of Aaron Spelling's uh, producing career. Uh, Aaron Spelling being the, just to bring everybody up to speed, the uh, Dallas uh, born and raised uh, television producer who really burned it up, uh, learned his trade in the 60s. And then once the 70s came, which is the decade we're in right now, he became really uh, the king of television in a lot of important ways. He sure did. So this is a, a made-for-television movie. What we're uh, speak, a, talking to Amanda Reyes here, who's written the book on uh, made-for-television movies, one of them anyway. Yeah, <laughs> um, the only one. Are you in the house alone? Yeah, um, <laughs> thank you. Tell me about uh, what t uh, television movies were and how they came to exist. Well, uh, you know, it was interesting. So I've been doing a lot of work on another project on um, sort of the history of the beginning of the made-for-TV movie. It started in mm -hmm. 1964. It was a movie called See How They Run that aired on NBC and um, produced by Jack Laird. It starred William Forsyth. And they weren't that big of a deal. You know, there was a handful of them between 64 and 1969. And then the ABC Movie of the Week came in 1969. And at the time, it was the uh, most expensive whatever TV series to add to the date. It was like $18 million to produce the first set of TV movies. And um, Aaron Spelling was a big part of that. And he was actually supposed to be the first ABC movie of the week. Over the Hill Gang was supposed to run first, but they ended up doing a different movie called Seven in Darkness. And it, the, um, Over the Hill Gang ended up being number two. But he went wild in the world of TV movies. And in his book, he's like, I've produced over 200 and something TV movies. And yet he hardly spends any time on the book yeah, yeah. talking about it. And that's because TV movies have been treated like that the entire time they've existed. So I'm kind of not surprised that Aaron Spelling concentrated on other things. And that's probably because a lot of TV movies aired once or twice and then kind of disappeared. So many of them were lost until recently. Um, we're starting to release a bunch of them. This this movie we're going to watch tonight, The House That Would Not Die, uh, it was released through Kino Lorber a couple years mm -hmm. ago. And mm -hmm. I highly recommend everybody pick it up. Absolutely. Um, but uh, it was it was that people aren't paying attention to these movies, but yet some really good stuff came out of Aaron Spelling's, you know, studio at this time in the TV movie world. And we kind of debated over what would be a really good representation of that. And we ended up with this one because it starred Barbara Stanwyck. And um, as we talked about last time, Aaron Spelling was very sensitive to older actors and he'd had a long relationship with her. I mean, she's Tori Spelling's godmother. And um, he brought her to the TV movie world. She only did three of them. I think he produced all of them. Um, and this is the first of them. And it's a really good mystery. And I think it kind of shows the way Aaron Spelling incorporated these sort of progressive ideas, but he did it in very mainstream, subtle ways. Mm -hmm. And that's why we chose this one. And I think uh, I think everybody's going to kind of get it and they'll see, you know, it's a it's a horror movie uh, it is, or it's a mystery with horrific and supernatural elements um, that uh, that is about as scary as you could get, you know, but with being a television movie. And it's uh, a lot of the credit for that goes to the director of the film, John Llewellyn Moxie. And the source material is really good too. Barbara Michaels mm -hmm. wrote it and um, it's one of the best horror novels I've ever read. And it's part of a trilogy. I haven't read the other two called the Georgetown trilogy. They made a lot of differences and maybe we could talk about that later. But um, John Llewell and Moxie was a very prolific director. This was the f first, the only TV movie he directed in 1970, but then in 19, or yeah, 1971 and 72 season, he did three more Aaron Spelling titles, and then he did a movie called Escape, which was a pilot movie with Christopher George. I can't remember the name of the other three movies. It was, um, they were right on the top of my head. Uh, the Last Child was one of them, The Death of Me Yet, and I'm forgetting the third one. And then after that, John Lola Moxie directed anywhere from four to five TV movies a year for like the next decade. And they're all very good films. Yeah. And you were kind of talking about his style and mm -hmm. how he could make a film. He was known for being very economical and stylish at the same time. Yeah. And you'll notice some of the, you probably won't notice the economy that he uses because he's so clever at it. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit as it goes on about some of the economy that he uses. We'll talk uh, within our breaks because we're going to show the movie and we're going to take 
breaks where the TV commercials used to be. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about Moxie's style, uh, about how he directs. We'll talk a little bit about Spelling's uh, prolific output and also about the sort of economics of made for TV movies and why you would overspend the budget that the uh, that the network gave you on the, on the films. Why would why why in the hell would you do that? Well, there's a pretty good reason for doing that. We'll talk I, a little bit about that. I think that. I know what that might be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, we'll now begin uh, the house that would not die, and we'll see you guys in 17 minutes. Isn't it beautiful, Sarah? Come on, I can't wait to see it inside. Ruth, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. When was it built? Oh, late 1700, early 1800, I think. Terrible draft over here. This house isn't as well built as it looked. Oh, oh, what a shame. Probably the work of the appraiser. Cousin Hattie must have spun in her grave. Oh, with beautiful floors. Heat works, we won't freeze. Oh, Sarah, come and look at this beautiful table. Oh, Ruth, the kitchen. Oh, uh, I'm going to go upstairs. Oh, Sarah, here. Take these with you. Ruth, I found my room. I recognize it like I've been in it before. Come look.
I started to knock, but the door just swung open. I'm Pat McDougal, your nearest neighbor. I uh, saw your car parked outside and stopped to bid you a neighborly welcome. Oh, well, please come in. I'm Ruth Bennett. We just arrived. Well, welcome. Thank you. I uh, teach anthropology at the university. Oh, well, then you'll want to meet my niece, Vera. She's enrolled for the next semester. We'll be glad to have her. Ruth? Oh, this is my niece, Sarah Dunning. Sarah, this is Professor McDougall, our neighbor. Hello. I love this place. Yes, it is lovely. I assume you inherited it. These old places are seldom put up for sale. Well, it really was quite a surprise. Hattie Campbell was my cousin, but I, I didn't know her very well. I visited her here once when I was a young girl, and I, well, I guess she just took a shine to me. I've always had a strange sort of affinity for this place. You knew Hattie? Only than I do. I often try to invite myself in, but she was adept at discouraging visitors. Still, I knew it would look like this. I must have dreamed about it. You both must come and see the kitchen. Would you like to see the kitchen? Yes. We belong here. I just know we do. Oh, how lovely. And electricity. With all this antiquity, I didn't expect it. Look at that pewter collection. Ah. Oh. oh, it is handsome. Plenty of cupboard space. They sure are empty. Then it's lucky you're having dinner in my place tonight. Oh. Are we? Oh, no. Oh, yes, I insist. It's too late for you to drive back for supplies. Besides, some of the more interesting local people will be there tonight. I think it would be a good idea for you to know them. Well, that's very kind of you. You know, we have very cool autumns here. See? It's quite a draft. Don't check these doors and windows for you, otherwise you'll never get the house warm. Oh, no. You... I'll see you at 7. And I think I know a young man for you to save you from boredom. You weren't kidding about Sarah, the young man, and the boredom did, were you? I think they've forgotten we're here. Stan? Stan's all right. He's a thorn on my academic side. But your bright students always are. You say good morning to him, and he gives you an argument. But you like him, don't you? Oh, yeah. From a safe distance across that gap. Looks like he decided to take charge of Sarah. And he may just succeed. I think this is what Sarah has been looking for. Why she left home and came here with me. Which leaves us with an inescapable paradox, right? Right? Oh, I'm sorry. They look so right together, don't they? Ruth and Pat. He seems much nicer. Nicer? Here in his own house. Maybe I am hypocritical. Ruth's had enough trouble with the wrong man. She needs the right one for a change. And why did you leave home? Oh, I didn't. I'm on leave from the Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C., Executive Secretary. I'll stay a while and then decide whether to go back or look for work here. No encumbrances, then? Not now. I think I know who that is. Come on, give me moral support. Yes! <laughs> I knew you wouldn't mind. Tom, and how are you? Hello, Henry. Hello there, dear. Rachel, dear, how are things at the auxiliary? Oh, dear, it's so good to see you. Things are fine. Why don't you come around sometime? Maybe I will. You're Ruth Bennett, the Campbell House. When Pat told me you'd been invited tonight, I just couldn't resist coming to meet you. Oh, Pat, this is an improvement. Yes, I understand Cousin Hattie wasn't too friendly. I um, don't mean your cousin, dear. Oh. But you are going to be friendly, aren't you? Oh, I do hope so. Ruth, this is my Aunt Delia, who thinks she needs no introduction. And her friend, Sylvia Wall. Forgive me for crashing the party, but you know I've been longing to see the Campbell House. Would you tell me all about it? Am I really going to see the inside? Your cousin was most... Why did you bring her along? She insisted. What could I do? 
<laughs> Sylvia does the most wonderful seances. And she's writing a book about our local haunts. Do you know I've never been to a seance? There's your opportunity. It would be fun, Ruth. Maybe Ruth doesn't want to have a seance. Oh, yes, I do. It's just that, well, the house has been closed for such a long time and... I... Well, all right. But would you give me a week or so, you know, to sort of clean up? Of course we will. And we'll all come, won't we? All six of us. I'm not sure I can make it. Why, Pat? I think you're afraid. No. But in my line of work, you do pick up knowledge of these things. Witchcraft, black magic, spiritism. And the mischief they can work on the susceptible mind. It's hardly part of entertainment. Now, who said anything about entertainment? We're very serious. We'll be there, dear. He will, too. This house is like an iceberg. Almost finished? Just finished. My faithful chaperones. Where do you see what we found in this old junk shop? Hi, Pat. Let's put it over here in a minute. Well, uh, isn't it perfect for this house? Handsome looking fellow, isn't he? I think Sarah fell in love with him. Oh. Pat? Isn't he beautiful? Well? Pat, what's the matter? Oh, I don't know. I'm a little dizzy. It's nothing. Well, go wash up. I'll get you a drink. It's a housewarming present from us. Thank you, both of you. It's perfect. Now, let's get ready for dinner.
Did you drop it? No. I was out in the kitchen. I came down for some milk. I heard a sound. I ran in here and there it was. But how I don't could know. You... Oh, Ruth, it's ruined. Oh, maybe not. Maybe I can have it repaired. I'll take it into town tomorrow and see. Ruth, it was so weird. Speaking of weird things, did you hear someone out in the garden calling? Calling for someone or a pet, maybe, called Andy? Just now? Who'd be way out here looking for a pet in the middle of the night? <laughs> I guess I just dreamed it. Maybe we shouldn't have a seance in this house after all. Barbara Sandwick and Kitty Wynn, Richard Egan. Uh, so nice seeing uh, all these wonderful actors. Stan Stanwyck was beloved by her fellow actors. And you were saying that was Kitty Wynn's, because Kitty Wynn later on uh, had a career, did Panic at Needle Park and The Exorcist and Correct. all that stuff. I think this was her first role mm -hmm. on film anyway. And um, and I was just saying how exciting that must have been when she got that phone call and they're like, Barbara Stanwyck's going to be your co-star. and. Oh my God, I'm working already with like the most elite, coolest person in Hollywood I can think of, you know? Yeah. And you were saying how wonderful she was to the cast and crew. She was like mm -hmm. famous for being a really great to work with. And I imagine that makes sense because her relationship with Aaron Spelling was such that they were very close. And Aaron mm -hmm. Spelling was also very well known for being this kind of Southern gentleman, they would call him, mm -hmm. having mm -hmm. this very kind of attitude with people. And I read an interview with them where they actually pointed out how nice he was because I think they were expecting this kind of cigar chomping mogul. Yeah. And he kind of defied all of those stereotypes in his career. He was an absolute fan and he would treat the stars I mean, from what I've read from when he would work with guest stars, he would, you know, send a limo. He would, you know, there'd be a dressing room with a star on it and all of that. Like he, he really treated them like stars, even though in a lot of cases they were sort of like has-beens and Stanwyck, he never called Stanwyck a has-been, but she, you know, she wouldn't have gotten the same kinds of roles um, being an older woman at that point. So he gave her like a lead role like this. And um, we see that scene, that sort of gothic horror, uh, you know, fantasia scene, the dream sequence. Um, and you look at that, and that's a good example, I think, of, of John Lowell and Moxie, the director of this thing, saving time in some of his scenes. Some of those setups are very economical, like where there's um, where we see uh, the, the two uh, principles arrayed here, and then we see in deep focus the other two principles, and then they do a reverse of that shot. He, he does some very economical stuff there in order to spend more time on uh, some of the stuff that really needs more effects, like the dream sequence. Yeah, when you're making four movies a year, you yeah. really have to be able to go <laughs> in and do it. And there were a handful of directors that did television. We were talking about another one named David Lowell Rich, uh, mm -hmm. who just understood it. And although John Lowell and Moxie did all kinds of movies, I think his work in genre is almost unmatched. And the year after this, or at least maybe two years after this, he did Night Stalker, mm -hmm. which would end up being one of the highest rated TV movies of all time. And and still to this day is such a beloved classic mm -hmm. uh, and a great example of a really good me for TV movie. But um, he just knew what he was doing. He could just walk into the these shoes. And he also did a lot of episodics at the time too. You would see his name and stuff. Like later, I remember I'm a huge Magnum PI fan and he would show him and David Hemmings and people, these really amazing filmmakers mm -hmm. were coming and doing episodics too. And he would do them and the TV movies. And so 
I can't think of a movie he did that I haven't loved, but he was just really good at it. He didn't have a signature, so he's a journeyman. And people say that, and I think it's sort of derogatory, but I don't think so at all. I think that just shows exactly how talented somebody is, that they can just come into anything and make it amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he, all of the, you never look at a, a John Llewellyn Moxie movie and say, well, they cut corners. You never look at a John Llewellyn Moxie movie and say, oh, they're, they must have had bad, um, even like had bad sound on the location because they had to sync the sound. They're all like, they're just technically so well made, you know, and that, and you also never look at a John Llewellyn Moxie movie that I've seen and say, there's a bad performance. Yeah, it's interesting. So I think his name was Jeffrey Bloom. Is that um, he wrote a TV movie called Through Naked Eyes, which John Llewellyn Moxie directed. Mm -hmm. And I contacted him about it. And I think he went to the set once and he said that he was just such a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting. And maybe we'll talk about it later because I think it's a spelling co-production, but I can't remember now and I don't want to still spelling spotlight but nightmare in madam county is one of the grittiest made for tv movies yeah. ever made and john lola moxie made that yeah and um and it's it's amazing to see this kind of wonderful sweet guy making nightmare in madam county so you know he just could do anything it was just really wonderful and to get to sort of spe spellings trademarks here um one of spellings trademarks is glamour and so you know we have barbara stamick here dressed not as an old maid but she's dressed as pretty glamorous like she looks great she's wearing like the figure fitting outfits that nolan miller made for her who dressed her and that's uh that's another sort of spelling trademark working with nolan miller and then having glamour having older women uh allowed to be glamorous yeah. that's also kevin spelling. thomas uh when he reviewed this it was mm -hmm. the only review i could find of it he he liked the movie he didn't think it was a masterpiece but he really mm -hmm. liked it and he was talking about her wardrobe. It really stood out to him. And it, I'm glad that you brought up some of these things about her because she's also an independent woman. Mm -hmm. She's single. So she's going to have a love interest in this. But but she comes into this as an older woman who, as far as I know, has never been married or anything. But nobody would call her an old maid or a spinster. Mm -hmm. And she's taking care of herself and her niece who comes from an unhappy home life. Um, and that's why she's helping her. And it's like um, she's doing everything. It's like that you can have it all kind of thing. And... Um, and she's just so beautiful. I don't I, I don't know how to word it. Like, because when you say, oh, they're older or for her age, it seems so insulting. But she's she's showing that life doesn't stop at mm -hmm. a certain mm -hmm. point. And um, that's really important. And that's something I think Spelling was really in tune with. Yeah. And I mean, and we have the just it's so wonderful to have a chance to have lead performances from these people because you're just not going to get a lead performance generally from a woman of her age. With, you know, in, with a romance, yeah, exactly. Looking like exactly. that, bring it. I know, I love it. I lo <laughs> I'll take as thing. much of it as you want to give me. And the audiences did too, like, audiences wanted that. And it took somebody like Aaron Spelling to kind of kind of grok that and to get that and to actually give that to audiences, and yeah. which he did again and again. As we move on with this series, um, we'll talk about some of maybe what I think are sort of misconceptions about uh, Spelling's work with Jiggle TV, et cetera, mm -hmm. like stuff that was made, like this is male gaze type material uh, that I think has been um, maybe sort of wrongly assessed sometimes and been sort of passed on by people who maybe haven't watched much of the work or maybe studied the work that much. I agree, I agree. So let's uh, let's kind of get back into this. We'll be back in t 10 minutes after this. So this is a short act break here. So we'll resume uh, with The House That Would Not Die. Come in. You're way early. We thought we could help out. Well, now that you're here, I did forget this, Mr. Pyle. Sam, would you mind the wood is out there? Pleasure. Now, the kitchen. Oh, what a lovely surprise. You have an opener? Uh-huh. Does Madam Sylvia approve of spirits before a seance? I do, as a necessity. Could I have two glasses? Mm -hmm. Sample? Mm. Tastes good. You look good. Oh, I tried. Hard. You smell good.
I, uh, I need some matches for the fireplace. I'll get them for you. What's wrong? Nothing. I, I just dropped a glass. Please light the fire. Ruth, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. That's all right, Pat. Don't worry about it. Sylvia, why didn't we invite the ghost to dinner? Well, now, don't be flip Pat. There should always be a skeptic. Now, let's all sit down together. Will you turn the light out, Mr. Whitman, and then come back and complete the circle? Is there something against spirits working in the light? Pat, spirits take strength from the dark. Perhaps that's the natural law of their world. We need air to breathe, don't we? Now, let's join hands. And be silent. I shall try to summon my guide. Blocking her way. Do you feel the chill in the room?
Darling, you, you're dreaming. Wake up. I love how St Stanwick is like this tiny woman, you know, like 98 pounds at the most. And she has such presence. She's really amazing. She really does. Yeah. And I was just thinking about, wow, two women in nightgowns fighting. Yeah. That's a TV staple. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> Not only for TV movies, but in episodic TV later yeah. on. In Aaron yeah. Spelling's episodic TV. We were talking about how they like kind of injected yeah. like uh, very PG kind of sexy things and the mm -hmm. woman in the nightgown in the gothic kind of tv mm -hmm. movies was very prevalent yeah. and here we have barbara stanwick doing it which is kind of different and nice and yeah. I, I really appreciate it but that scene was really fun yeah yeah it really is so um this this was an abc movie of the week there are different kinds of tv movies there are different tv movies that were made under different conditions but the abc movie of the week those were at this point i think on tuesday still probably i think so i think so and um and uh, sometimes they would be used as like a tryouts for a uh, pilot. Sometimes they'd be used for pilots that had been paid for, but were not actually picked up as series. And sometimes uh, more frequently, they were just um, original properties uh, that, that were made. Um, and TV movies happen for a lot of different reasons, including um, the expense of paying residuals on all films made after 1948, uh, including the need uh, that um, television had for more color movies. Um, and it really worked out in some interesting ways. I, I can't really speak so much for the way ABC, made ABC Movie of the Weeks worked because they may have worked a little bit different. I know when ABC Circle Films came around, it was a sort of more of a co-production unit. Um, but generally with made for television movies, this is my understanding, you can correct me if you, I did a lot of research when I did a commentary, is the producers of the made for television movies would get a certain amount of money from the network to make the made for te television movies, um, but they would generally augment that with a budget surplus or surplus budget that would go into it. Um, so let's say they would get $800,000 from the network. They would want to make a $1.5 million movie, let's say, because 
after uh, it played two times on the network, after the network, ex network exercised its two screening option, uh, the rights reverted then to the producer. And so they wouldn't want to be stuck with a movie that was too cheap uh, because then there was a secondary market. And sometimes that would mean overseas theatricals. Sometimes that would mean the reruns that they would then sell in syndication packages. Uh, but, for, but, but generally the producers would try to make the films a little bit more expensive. Um, and then the other thing is the networks often, the networks generally would have final say on casting. So um, the producers could make what they wanted to, but they really had to have um, sign off from the network about the casting. I feel like there was a lot of network oversight probably that, mm -hmm. because they were very specific about what they wanted on their screens and mm -hmm. um, the demographics were important, right? Mm -hmm. Attracting the right audience, which was women, 18 age, uh, women aged 18 to 49. Um, that's interesting what you say, because back then the ABC movie of the week cost approximately $250,000, which was even less. So the ABC movie of the week, um, and of course now I've forgotten his name, the guy at, uh, ABC who supposedly created it, got it from Roy Huggins, um, mm -hmm. who, who did an interview in Variety and he was like, you know, it'd be really successful as if we did these movies on a, like an anthology. Yep. And, um, and I think he had them at like 300 or $450,000 and ABC went cheaper. And, um, and so that's interesting what you say about the other money coming in because i never actually thought about that they were generally co-productions it was like mm -hmm. abc and universal yep. would make and that universal was huge would make a tv movie and um that's so little money mm -hmm. for like a feature length even 74 minutes and it blows my mind so to hear that there was a little bit more money coming in the bag and that makes sense because later on when home video became more of a property people like charles freeze like one of the reasons why so many charles freeze movies are better remembered than a lot of these abc movies is because they had home video releases like mm -hmm. initiation of sarah are you in the house alone all these are charles freeze movies and so um that makes sense to me that they would it would revert back and they would try to find a different venue for it yeah, because they were going to own it for, and nobody could have anticipated home video was going to be what it was, although probably some did. Um, but but yeah, a lot of that, they ended up being pretty profitable, sort of, um, uh, because you could sell it, resell it, and resell it, um, and sell it on term, so that, you know, somebody would have the right to show it for two years, but then the term would revert. So there was a lot of different... Um, smart producers and certainly Aaron Spelling was one of the smartest uh, had sort of the uh, money making ability to kind of make it a cash cow that could keep working for them. I did see a really interesting ad for maybe it was ABC Circle Films. I'm not sure when they got started, but ABC did an ad in one of the trades, two page ad about their TV movies. And I think it was they were selling them as packages, mm -hmm. which I knew they did. Yeah. But they had a whole bunch of movies on there, including the house that, that would not die. Um, and Run, Simon, Run, which is another Aaron Spelling movie that Love, Hate, Love might have been on there. And um, and they had all these pictures of the actors like in a collage. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, what a great ad. But it was to sell to foreign markets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's so interesting how you could monetize it. It would it it was they'd be a little bit too expensive just to play one time or two times as the case may be. So um, this reminds me before we go back into it, I just I was reading a a, a book about uh, television production about um, Dick Powell who we talked about a bunch about last time because he had been Aaron Spelling's boss and it helped bring Aaron Spelling up mm -hmm. into television production. Um, one of the other writers, which might have been. Uh, Gerber, uh, David Gerber, or oh. um, it might have been, I don't remember who it was, the guy who did Mission Impossible, or, um, whatever his name was. Um, but very early on, they were all working together kind of under the umbrella of Dick Powell. And uh, one of the guys went and said, this guy, Aaron Spelling, he's a schlock master. He said, you know, we're out here doing this like fine work. And he's and Dick Powell, who was very mild mannered, who was the head of the production company, like shut him down. and was like, listen, you guys, Aaron Spelling keeping me in business. You guys are out here trying to win Emmys. You know, you guys are giving me two hours a week. He's giving me 20 hours a week, you know. Well, also, Aaron Spelling, like he talked a lot about it because he came from a very poor kind of background. He was like, sometimes people want to come home and watch something and just escape. It doesn't have to be, you know, this like uh, super serious drama. And that's fine. And, and that's great. But like sometimes people just they want to see how the other half lives. They want to see that they're flawed. Yeah. Maybe they want to do something like Fantasy Island, where mm -hmm. you just go and you have whatever you want happens and, and everybody ends up happy at the end. And he's like, you know, people want that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for some reason, 
that's become like an insult. Yeah, yeah. And even he said he regretted, like he was called the cotton candy king or something like mm -hmm. that. And he, it just makes him grit his teeth because he was like, well, I did this and this and this. But even when he's saying it, it's like, well, why does boys in the band or the best little girl in the world have to be on a different tier than Charlie's Angels? Because they're all wonderful. You know what I mean? So it was even ingrained in him. But he knew that uh, people just want to enjoy their time off you know it's it's huge and it's like you don't have to be an it doesn't mean you're an idiot if you're making escapist television no. and it's a way it's kind of like um it's almost like a lesson that's been forgotten like in in music you know if you look at the history of popular music people decide they want to dance then they kind of stop wanting to dance two years later they're going to want to dance again yeah. and that's the history of popular music and i think like if you look at the history of television which we are is the name of the show it's like you will find that there's escapism and then escapism goes away and people want the serious stuff, but then they're going to want escapism again. And it almost feels like right now, currently 2022, is that what year it is? Mm -hmm. uh, that, we're, uh, that we're almost kind of like due for an escapist cycle with television because there's been so much uh, serious television. I can't wait. Although I think a lot <laughs> of it's coming uh, and we're seeing it, I mean, in the horror, part, like something like Stranger Things mm -hmm. might have like a total escapist value. I yeah. mean, I'm sure there's subtext in there and stuff. But uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's coming and it's here in a lot of ways. Yeah. And Aaron Spelling, it, you know, you could do a lot worse if you're in television production or if you're writing scripts for television or spec scripts or whatever. You could do a lot worse than try to understand from the master of escapism, like how to do it. So studying Aaron Spelling's work, even though like your professors will tell you this is the master of schlock, he's actually a master, a true master of a particular kind of entertainment that's escapist. And you could do a lot worse than learn from Aaron Spelling. Absolutely. All right, let's resume our film and then we'll be back in, I don't remember what it is, 12 minutes or something and talk a little bit more. Look. And this morning, it was as if nothing had taken place. She didn't show a sign of remembering anything at all. The painting, the seance, her attack on me, nothing. She's never done anything like this before. Oh, no, no, no. At least not before the seance. Now, it started then. Something happened then. And that wasn't Sarah up in the hallway last night. Now, wait. You're describing a classic incident of schizophrenia. Yes, a seance may have had something to do with it. But only as a psychological trigger for a condition that already existed. Oh, yes, but there are other things, such as? Well, the wind, the sound, these bruises. Pat, how do I explain being attacked by my young niece who fought like a madman? Ruth, I don't know. But if she is schizophrenic, that could explain her strange behavior and her attack on you. Well, I can't believe that. No. No, she's always been so so well adjusted. So have I. We've had a very special affection for each other since the day she was born. Well, don't let that affection blind you to what's really happening. Maybe Sarah needs professional help right away. Let her stay to dinner. I'd like to talk to her. Well, yes, of course, if you think it would. Oh, that must be Sarah. It's dark early. Stan, Pat. It's so nice to be here where it's warm. I don't know what I like best about Sherry, the color or the taste. Maybe both. Yes. Wow, you did it again, Ruth. Another delicious dinner. Thank you, Pat. You're always so compliment. Me. Please. Help. Sarah. Me. No, 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 not Sarah. Sarah. What's happening again? Help. Who are you? Help. What's your name? Help me, please. Help. What do you want us to do? Put her on the couch. No, I'm, I'm all right. I'm just so tired. Ruth. 
Ruth, believe me, we've got to get her to something right away. Last night she attacked you. Tonight? I know one of the head men at St. Elizabeth's. I could call him right now. St. Elizabeth? It's a psychiatric clinic. Which is exactly what she does not need right now. Look, I didn't want to tell you this before. But I saw, I actually saw another face over Sarah's during the seance. You saw it too, didn't you? Well, did you? I, I, I thought I saw something. Sarah doesn't have the history of a schizo. This started at the seance. I think she's possessed. Possessed? The only thing she's possessed by is a second personality that's trying to take over. And where did that personality suddenly come from? Her own mind, where it's always been. Dormant until now. Man, it's got another voice, another face. You put her in the clinic right now and you're going to do her permanent psychic damage. Do you want me to call St. Elizabeth? Hey! You look like guilty conspirators. It gave us quite a shock. Are you all right? Okay, Ruth. We'll put it off for a couple of days. Here, I guess you can use this. No, thank you. I never touch spiritous beverages. You all look so strange. I don't know why I said it. It was only a silly joke. It's no joke. It's all tied up in this house. Something violent happened here. Something tragic. Otherwise, why would this spirit be earthbound? So many people lived here and died. But mostly Campbells. And it must have been a young girl like Sarah. And she isn't going to leave Sarah until she gets what she wants. Now, what we've got to do is find out who she was and what happened to her. We say these things so matter-of-factly. Is all this really happening? There may be more happening than you're aware of. The other night before the seance, when he kissed you, while you and Pat weren't alone in this room, there was something. It passed over Pat. I saw it in his face. He's a good guy. He wouldn't have treated you that way, you know? I know. I know. All right, where do we start? The attic is crammed full of diaries, papers, but I wouldn't know where to begin. Why don't we check out the Hall of Records? Birth, death certificates, we might find something. I guess we should have started in the house. As I said, that attic is jammed to the rafters with junk. And I... Oh, by the way, what time are we supposed to meet Sarah and Pat? This should be in the square by now. Hi. Any luck? No. All records prior to 1795 were destroyed by a fire. Where's Sarah? Didn't she get a ride with you? One of her classmates said she'd drop her off. Well, then she must be at the house. It will be dark soon. I said I'd be home early. I'll get the car. Now, look, you two, don't worry. I don't want her in that house alone after dark. I don't care how silly you think it is. I'll drive you there, no matter how silly I think it is. Please, hurry. All right, but we can't make it before nightfall. It's almost an hour's drive. Lights on in the house at all. She stopped off somewhere. Shh. Listen. Did you hear that? It's bolted from the inside! 
trying to sign you. I can't turn it. Let me try. You all right? How did this get on the floor? What happened? We're getting out of this house. I'll get rid of it. I'll sell no, it. I don't. No, I can't leave. I won't. It'll never be over if I go. But Sarah, it's all that no, has happened. No, you go if you want to. I can't leave. I can't explain it, but I know I mustn't. Ruth, don't worry. I'll stay here tonight. I'll stay too. Thank you. All right. All right. Wonderful movie here. Um, so you've you've seen quite a lot of uh, Aaron Spelling's TV movies. Um, what are some of your favorites? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I well, this era was pretty prevalent for him. And uh, he did a really interesting movie and it was actually in it was really highly rated. It called The Last Child with Michael Cole, which is like a sci fi film about a couple who aren't allowed to have a child in this kind of dystopian future because their child had died and mm -hmm. you just get one child and if something happens to it that's it and so they're trying to have a child and he did Saint school for girls and then mm -hmm. he remade it in 2000 with shannon doherty and right. those are both really good films oh the, the remake is good too yeah, yeah they're they're very different so when he did the one with shannon doherty charmed was huge so mm -hmm. he went this kind of charm route with it mm -hmm. and um it's so good and she's wonderful in it and the original is a lot of fun um this is one of my absolute favorite tv movies uh and we can talk about the ending i don't know if we'll get a chance to but um this is one of those strangely moving films um he did death at love house i think he did a really good one called death cruise which was like a love boat except they're killing people right and uh, and then he did the three love boat pilots which are really good too mm -hmm. um and uh those are the ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head that mm -hmm. I think are like really exceptional, but he did it. Well, he also did the best little girl in the world, which I mentioned earlier. And that's the, one of the first times people really talked about anorexia mm -hmm. and kind of the open, the discourse for that. And um, so he, every so often he would do one that would have this sort of more overtly political or uh, topical kind of thing happening in it. But mostly he stuck to like this really great Gothic kind of um, setting for his films in this early. Oh, he also did Crowhaven Farm, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. And a re another, we've got Hope Lang again as this kind of semi-older actress leading this film, dealing with a lot of subtext about marital issues and infertility inside uh, what is kind of folk horror, mm -hmm. you know? Um, he was really good at that. So um, those are the ones I can think of. Love, Hate, Love's really good with Peter Haskell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he did a lot of really good ones. Yeah, and he did um, sometimes um, when you look at his book. Now, the book is clearly it's been through editors that have told them people don't care about this. They don't want you to go into the weeds on this. But um, one of the TV movies he talks about there is, uh, is it Little Ladies of the Night. Oh, is that yeah, the yeah. one? That was huge. Which when was it, came it was out, a yeah. really it was more like one of the most popular TV movies ever made. And it is a topical, you know, rather more than an escapist one. It is sort of like a topical one. 
but uh, significantly, it's not based on a true story. He didn't he didn't do a lot of stuff based on a true story ripped from today's headlines. That's right. And he said that he didn't like doing that because he felt like it made um, it created copycats. You know, people would do copycat crimes because they would see the oh, made for TV movie about it. Wow. Okay, that's which I think is sort of funny that that's the reason he didn't do so many of the um, uh, ripped from today's headlines because that was a a returning current in uh, made for tv movies and still is i'm sure yeah that was more prevalent i think in the 90s yeah yeah that became really really popular but um i never thought of that that's an interesting viewpoint of his especially yeah. in the age of this because in it's going to really kick into gear when born innocent comes on tv mm -hmm. but born innocent is the whole reason why we even got a family viewing hour like it changed the face of television that's the linda blair um, yeah reform school and yeah. correct and yeah. that was that was a not based on a true story, but a kind of rip from the headlines mm -hmm. sort of thing. And it did create a copycat crime. Mm -hmm. And then Kojak got into it because there was that guy who's Ronnie Zamora. Do you remember him? He killed an elderly person. He said it was because of violence on television. And, mm -hmm. and Kojak was one of the shows that he cited. And there was a, a lot of, towards the end of the 70s, there was a change sort of in the landscape of television because of that. So I don't know when Aaron Spelling made that statement, but that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, he made it in his book. So, um, that's, oh, yeah, uh, I guess after the yeah, fact. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, right, right. So uh, that's interesting. Um, I think we'll uh, we'll continue on with our film, and then uh, after it's over, we're going to talk a little bit about the ending of this and about how uh, how how the story works. Unless there's anything you want to go into before Just we the resume. ratings and stuff. Yeah, it was very oh, popular. The ratings, TV right. Movie. Yeah, 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 right, 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 right. 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 Yeah, you you uh, you always know a lot about the ratings and like the night it came on and what else was on that night. So I always find that so super fascinating. So let's resume. We'll resume the film, and then we'll. Uh, I, I don't remember if this is our last chapter uh, of the film or not, or if we've got one more after this. But uh, kick it, Doug. Phenomenon. Will you just listen? When people are under strain, like all of us have been, there must be logical explanations for what may appear to be your mystical phenomenon. Be honest, can't you? You heard that voice out there. You heard it. Admit it. I thought I heard it, but the wind was blowing and we were all excited. Oh, boy, do you have a wide open mind with the proof right there. Could you two be quiet? You'll wake Sarah. Ruth, I'm sorry. I'll be in Sarah's room if you need me. Thank you, Pat. Ruth, would you mind if I get a start in the attic? All right. Good night.
What happened? What was that? You won't believe it. Did either of you close the cellar door? No. Dan, this thing just happened. I left this book on the table. It was on my way to bed. When suddenly I couldn't move. I could not move. The cellar door opened. Suddenly the house was filled with wind. There was a loud crash. When I turned around, this book was in the fire burning. Oh, come on, Stan. I tell you, something is trying to stop us. Every time we get close, something happens. Some strange manifestation takes place. Look at this book. It's a diary of the year 1780. Who wrote it? I couldn't tell. It was too faded. But the address is a local one. Well, I don't care what's in there or any place else. We are leaving this house right now. <laughs> Dan, take Sarah upstairs to my room. You and I will sleep in the den. Okay. I hope you'll find it comfortable here. Oh, we will. We will. I like the sound of that. Pat, after class tomorrow, would you go back to the house with me? I'd like to really go through that attic. Ruth, I don't think you and Sarah should go back to that house. Oh, please, Pat, please. All right. Stan. I'm scared. Why? Do you th think I'm crazy? Of course not. It has nothing to do with you. Look, it's all tied up with that house. I'm glad you stayed. Sarah. No. I know you like me. And I... But everything's happening so... So strange. Do you understand? Of course. Just remember something. Whatever happens, I'll always be right here. I'm glad. Good night. Good night. Where do we start? Four addicts are all alike. Fascinating junk shops. Well, there must be something around here to give us a clue. Oh. That isn't it. Find anything? Nothing. Oh, Ruth, come here. Hmm? Look. No writing desk. Oh. But it's locked. Oh, try and open it, because these things are usually jammed with papers and diaries and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Oh, try here. Mm. Nothing. Sometimes they have secret compartments. They usually have a catch. If I can find it, it'll be easy. Okay, here. Oh. oh. 
Oh. And here, there's something. Looks like an old scroll. This could be the key we're looking for. It says that the house has been remodeled several times. Oh, here's something that Hattie has underlined. At which point in late 1780, she seems to have simply vanished. Who did? Well, wait, wait, let me go back. Right now, um, the writing has faded. Uh, oh, uh, Martha Campbell, age 23, wife of General Douglas Campbell, died in childbirth. The child or daughter lived and cared for her father and all his needs until she was 20. At which point, in late 1780, she seems to have simply vanished. And that's when old Campbell became a recluse. Uh, oh, yes, down here, Hattie states that old Campbell came to be known as crazy because he would stand in the garden alone at night uh, calling for his daughter's return. Wait a minute. What was that voice calling? What was the daughter's name? Well, it isn't listed. Hattie seems to have left it out, wouldn't you know? We can look it up in the Bible. Oh, Stan, be careful of those pages. I will. Very... I'll be very careful. Here it is. Yes, here's the general. His wife, Martha. There's another name underneath that's been inked out. Well, that's why Hattie left it out. It's marked out. Stricken out. Her father must have disinherited her. I wonder what she did. Well, I don't suppose we'll ever know. Without her name. Pat, do you have a knife or something? Yeah. <laughs> Amanda. 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 Mandy. Andy. Amanda. Annie, come home. Something happened. She vanished and the old man wanted her back. He still does. Of course. Now what we've got to do is find out what happened. Amy, help. Amy, please help. Please help, Amy. How? Help. How can we help you? To return to your father? No! reach her anywhere, and I, I thought she'd be safe here. I'm afraid you're right. Well, it's going to be stopped. It's got to be. How? Oh. Exorcism. We've got to get rid of her. I'm going to ask Sylvia Wall for another seance. Well before the exorcists. That's so right. you can't look at this and say, well, that was a ripoff of the exorcists. That was, uh, you know, just a couple of years before. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. This has got some really solid um, thriller stuff in it. I think this is a really made, well-made ghost story. And we were talking about the source material. And I don't remember if I mentioned this live on the air or before, but uh, Barbara Michaels was an Egyptologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think she had a doctorate. And she um, incorporated a lot of... Um, 
research principles into mm -hmm. her writing and you saw a little bit of it they were at the hall of records or something in mm -hmm. this and in the book she goes knee deep in the research process and it's fascinating because nobody researches like that anymore like mm -hmm. that primary research yeah. and she takes you through it in a really engaging way and it's one of the best and scariest story novels i've ever read and um and i think they do a wonderful adaptation of this and one of the things i was telling you that's different about it is that in the book it takes place in georgetown and and if you've ever been to georgetown the neighbors are literally like this far away from you mm -hmm. and so there's a part where they come home and the house is like lighting up in all these different places and they're just standing outside and their neighbors are just three feet away from them the entire time here they chose a much more isolated location and i don't think one's better than the other but that's the major change i see in this but they do keep a lot of the research in there and like when they find the Bible and um, and it's really fun the way they let this film unfold. But one, another thing we talked about, though, is that it does have elements in it that you might not see today so much. And when Egan um, kind of forces himself on Stanwyck, which we saw at the beginning and then that slapping scene, those mm -hmm. are things that are like, oh, but um, but at the time they didn't seem as questionable mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as they might now, yeah. you know. Um, but, uh, but it's a pretty solid film. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's interesting that Georgetown thing, that's another interesting sort of analog with the, with the exorcist. That's right. so I don't know how that stuff all kind of comes together, but it does. So speaking of research, uh, one thing that you like to research is, uh, ratings and how, 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 how this did. And it's sometimes mind blowing to hear like what the share was on some of these films because you'll never see that again no never so uh so this movie did really well it came in so in the 1970 71 season there weren't nearly as many made for tv movies being produced as there was even i think the next year so there were about 76 original made for tv movies during this season it aired on october 27th 1970 um on abc as an abc movie of the week it um brought in <clears throat> excuse me a 25.5 slash 38 and all that basically means i have to look at the second number because mm -hmm. it's hard to kind of break those down 38 basic is the share. And what that means is 38% of homes with televisions yeah. who were watching TV the night this aired, so not all the TVs, but a lot of them, were tuned in to the house that would not die. And so that basically means that 40% basically of America sat down and was like, I want to see what Barbara Stanwyck's doing in this house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I, like I said, I only saw one review, but it was pretty positive, but that's, I don't even know what that translates into, into millions because TVs were pretty much in most homes at yeah, this point. Yeah. So, and everybody was watching. So it's like, it's incredible to think that that many people watch and to give a good comparison is a really popular show is the walking dead right and you'll see now in the trades 10 million people turned into the finale of the walking dead and people are like wow 10 million people that show would have been the lowest rated show yeah, of the week yeah. um like 50 million people watch rhoda get married i think right mm -hmm. on on rhoda um and so like you can't even compare the numbers uh, but we only we had lesser options then but water cooler talk was really big and um and so and this was just one of several made for tv movies that made the 1970 71 season in the top 10 that were spelling produced i mentioned a couple of them uh, and i don't see if i can remember all of them you said wild women mm -hmm. i think earlier that not only ended up in the top 10 but it also uh its rerun ended up in the top 20 um crowhaven farm which is a classic mm -hmm. was in the top mm -hmm. 10 i saw run simon run on there which i think is burt reynolds yeah, right. For Reynolds playing a Native American. I believe yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Love, Hate, Love, which I mentioned with Peter Haskell, and I forgot to mention Ryan O'Neill's in that, because whatever, mm -hmm. it's Peter Haskell. Let's <laughs> just deal with it. Um, and uh, those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head, but there were four or five others that were on there. And so he was really cranking them out, but they were quality and people were tuning in to see them. And so it's just extraordinary for me to think about all of those eyes on this little mm -hmm. film, which we just, my husband just said, that would make a really great stage play. Mm -hmm. It's a very small film. So um, it's just kind of amazing, like what we watched back then and how they presented it and how we were so caught up in sort of these amazing, just tiny little things, these character driven ghost stories where like, there's no violence in it, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. really. Um, and it's just amazing to me, and it warms my heart to think about these days. And, and all pitched towards women. Women were That's the, right. uh, women were the deciders generally for um, what they were going to watch when they watch these TV movies. So 
um, these were these were pretty almost all. I mean, there were westerns and uh, some adventure movies and whatnot that would be geared towards men, but almost all geared towards women. Very female centric, and if they didn't necessarily have a female lean, I can't think of one offhand, mm -hmm. but like they tried really hard to deal with things like problems in the home, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and marital problems were huge and infertility, like Crowhaven Farm I was mentioning is a folk horror, but it's really about infertility and marital woes. And so they were really reaching out. And I mentioned Night Terror to you off mm -hmm. camera mm -hmm. with Valerie Harper, mm -hmm. which is a chase movie that everybody says, Oh, it reminds me of Duel, but it's actually about a woman who's been told, Oh, you're a housewife and you're really not that good at stuff. And you really shouldn't drive across the country by yourself. And then when she's being pursued by this killer, she stays one step ahead of him the entire mm -hmm. time. And at the very end of the film, her husband says, you know, you're not Gloria Steinem. And she says, you're right, not yet. And you're <laughs> like, wow, they've just entered a whole new discourse yeah. of this on mainstream film where millions of people are tuning in about, and it's about second wave feminism. So it's really interesting to look at these films. In case of this, I think we've mentioned what it is. It's about the independent single woman, older mm -hmm. woman taking care of herself mm -hmm. is where they're getting the kind of female centric storytelling here. And just to go back and just to kind of amplify the point that you made about the rating and the share is um, more people would have watched this than watched Patton that year. You know, until Patton came on television, it's like Patton was a huge hit film, but more people watched this yeah, than watch Patton, which is incredible. Me too, probably. Although yeah. I think I remember watching Patton when I was a kid when it originally aired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's just so I want people to kind of remember that, that, the, that these were these movies kind of came and went, but they really left an impact on people because yeah. so many of us saw it. As, as all of us know, who when we're uh, out and about and we uh, present ourselves in some contexts as experts on this stuff and people walk up to us and say, I saw this one movie when I was a kid. It happens all the time. And it's it's so often TV movies mm -hmm. and it's so often bad Ronald, let's face yeah. it, but it's so often <laughs> yes. TV movies that people remember, you know. Yeah, and I, I love that. It's I never can guess the movie, and it's always really obvious. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. And then somebody, I'll post it somewhere on Facebook or something, and then somebody will be like, oh, yeah, that's the initiation of Sarah. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what it yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. But I, I can never, but lots of people do ask me about that. They really sit up there in this weird, dusty memory. It's true. Yeah, yeah and and it's like I had one. It was another Ernst Spelling movie, Five Desperate Women, and I won't go into it, but like it took me years to figure out what that film was. Yeah. But I was obsessed with it right. because I saw it as a kid and I loved it, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, they, they really did because they were saw, seen by so many people. Um, it really, and there were so many of them. It, it really has occupied a place in in human consciousness for people maybe of our generation and older, I think. You know? Yeah, and in our hearts. Yeah, and in our hearts too. So we got, uh, we're going to head into the, the thrilling climax of uh, the house that would not die, would not, could not, should not die. Let us sit as we were before. Let's join hands. This time, as we should have done before, we ask protection from the other side. We call upon you. All loving spirits come here and be with us tonight. We call upon you all loving spirits to be with us here tonight. No. No, help me. Help me. We call upon you all loving spirits to be with us here.
Don't break the circle! of any use to you. Oh, please, take my word for it. This is a terrible place. Get out. I beg of you. Get out of this house. Will you be all right when you drive? Yes, thank you. Let me see you to your car. Thank you. I'm sure that cellar door was closed securely. No wind could have blown it open. Or well, something did. What is it? What are you talking about? The cellar. Well, I'll come over in the morning and have a look down there. No. No, Pat. Not you. Please don't. Why? I, I, I don't know. I can't explain it, but please don't. She's right, Pat. But I can come back tomorrow afternoon. You want to come along? All right. Well, let's go. <laughs> cellar seems to be pretty new. Well, the house was remodeled several times. When you came down here before, did you see anything strange? No, but of course I wasn't looking for anything strange. That is nothing specific. Wait a minute. These stone walls must be the foundation for the original house. Uh -huh. So why timber back here? The foundations, the stone foundations, have to go on all the way under the living room. It looks as if the rest of the cellar has been sealed off. I wonder why. Ruth, would you clear off those shelves for me? All right. Hold this one, would you? 
What are you going to do? I'm going to try and break through this wall. With that? I can, but try. We can't wait to show Ruth what we found. They should be home by now. You think they discovered anything in the cellar? Well, I doubt it. Nothing as important as what we came up with. Ruth, come on, take a look. Grab that flashlight. Mm. Look at that. There's an old doorway. Oh. I'm not having much luck with this wood. It's almost petrified. Well, Stan, why don't you quit? It's getting so late. Yeah, besides, I need better equipment than this. Come on, let's go. Yes. Hello, Groundhogs. Any discoveries? Pat, what are you doing Where's here? Where's Sarah? She's on the car. We stopped by my place first, but when you weren't there, we decided this wouldn't keep. What wouldn't keep? Sarah and I spent the afternoon going through stacks of old newspapers. Maybe our friend Amy was guiding us. It could have taken weeks to find this. It's from a public notice placed by General Douglas Campbell, November 3, 1780. It's addressed to his beloved daughter, Amanda, and it implored her to return to her home and the love of her grieving father. She had eloped with one Anthony Doyle, captain of the Army of Independence, who has long worked to seduce her, not only from her loving duty to her father, but from her faith. Seduce her from her father? Mm -hmm. And from her faith. It must have been the end of the world for the old man. Come on, let's get back to Sarah. You find anything? Yeah, an old doorway that's boarded over. We're gonna find some tools. Just listen to me. Darling. You 
You've been possessed by the general all along, Pat. I first saw it when you and Ruth were in the kitchen. What we have to do now is find out what happened in that house. What really happened. Perhaps we saw what happened tonight. It looked as if the general, not you, Pat, but the general tried to kill someone. Pat, hypnotize me. Make Amy come. I have a feeling. I know that it's right. I'm not afraid, not of her. I feel a sadness, a sympathy for her. No. I want to help. No, no, Pat, please don't. The sympathy, it, it could be a surrender to a final possession. What we want is down in that cellar behind that wall. Oh, I can't bear the thought of any of us going back into that house. Ruth, we've got to. Look, maybe if we go back first thing in the morning, Sarah? Anthony found out. Found out what? Father. Traitor. Plotted with British. Anthony found that out and told the general he knew. Yes. Blood. The night you eloped? Told him. Told him. Terrible. 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 No. Not dead. Not dead. I'm going back first thing in the morning. You can't do it alone. I'll go with you. You can't go back. Ruth, I must. Besides, it'll be broad daylight. I'm going. I want to go. I must. If the answer is there in the cellar, whatever has to be settled, it must be settled between the general and Amy. I know it. I feel it. If you want this to end, I must be there so Amy can speak. Ruth, look, just keep this handy. It's Mace. The general tries to take over Pat again, spray it in his eyes. It won't hurt him, but it will stop him.
him. Please take it away. must have killed him that night, murdered him with that poker, and buried him here. That? with Anthony Doyle, the notice in the newspapers. But that was a lie. How can you elope with a dead man? Amy's comb. From the grave. She must have tried to defend Doyle. And the old man killed them both. And all because he couldn't bear the thought of her loving someone else. And for 200 years, Amy's been waiting for Sarah just till somebody could find out the truth. Well, we've done what Amy wanted. Let's leave them in peace. Oh, 
forgive me. Dear God, please forgive me. All right, great ending. I love awesome that ending movie. so much. Yeah, yeah, it they, kills me. They did such a good job with it. Like, well, you know, it's not just a horror movie. You know, it it really. Uh, by by the end of it, you know, you sort of realize you feel kind of invested in these characters. You know. Yeah, and the relationships that they have with each other, and uh, and you just really want everything to happen. But that thing about the dad at the end, that little voiceover, mm -hmm. and then the, and then it just says the end. It just always gets to me. It's one of those movies that just you're not expecting. It to be as moving as it is. And mm -hmm. I, it's another John Luella Moxie joint where he just like does something unexpected and makes it work, you know? It, it also happens, I, I noticed like even if I'm like, all the actors are good in this, uh, you know, they all are. Um, but all you really need is just the one actor giving a really good performance sometimes to suspend disbelief, to put you into that world. And Samick is certainly that kind of performer who can do that, in, you know. But everybody else is good. Kitty Wynn's really good. Uh, Michael Anderson, who's the son of the director Michael Anderson and the nephew of the director Michael Anderson is in this. And one of the most notable things I think he does in his acting is he does an American accent, which is very passable. Yeah, it is. I, I didn't even realize he was British until I was looking him up today. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's really impressive. Yeah, you, the, he yeah. plays the juvenile lead in this. And you never, you would never know he's putting on an American accent. British actors are, um, we've all, we've heard many of them put on American accents that are not quite uh, up to snuff. Yeah. I think of uh, Lawrence Olivier playing Big Daddy in uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof uh, as a good example. <laughs> and I think it's a testament, too, because we were talking about um, these movies were shot probably in like 10 or less days. Mm -hmm. And um, they're so good. Like the, everybody comes in and they really mean to make a good film. And that's another reason why I'm so passionate about them, because I think that gets kind of forgotten about that. There's a bunch of people working on this movie and they're mm -hmm. trying to do the best that they can with what they have. And often they do really good work, you know, and this is a prime example of a movie that they made for very little money um, in a very short period of time, probably had a very quick turnaround even in post-production. And here it is. And it's a it really, play so beautifully you know yeah it's um i don't think all producers all television producers um were necessarily trying to make uh, movies that would sort of stand the test of time and i think that's the thing about aaron spelling and again um if we were to sort of like bring up everything everybody said about Aaron Spelling, every TV critic and so forth he was known as like the guy who was making the schlock you know but um, but it really is true that like when you look at his stuff, it it holds up because he cared and because he, he wanted he hired people who cared too, you know, and who wanted to make a, a good film. Um, John Llewellyn Moxie, you know, you don't see bad films that he made. He he clearly cared about his reputation. Yeah, and they work together a lot, you know. So you go with the best and the people that you know are going to give you the product that you want, mm -hmm. you know. And also, I mean, we've talked about how. Everybody really likes Barbara Stanwyck and John Llewellyn Moxie had a good reputation and Aaron Spelling had a good reputation. And so you're also building really wonderful sets that people want to be at. And I think that helps too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do you know anything about the uh, behind the scenes stuff of, of like what Spelling visiting the sets? No, it's the thing about TV movies is that they, they're not very well documented. Yeah. And so whenever somebody calls me and say, could you do this commentary? And it's like, okay, but I can't do a ton of production history because there's just, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. And so there's, you don't hear a lot of these behind the scenes stories unless an actor tells one for in an interview somewhere, there's very little about these films. So I haven't heard about what it's like with him visiting the set, but I'm just judging based off of how he treats other people, yeah. like just interviewers and, and what you've heard from um, people who worked with him, you know what I mean? And I just assume he runs these like very, um, what I want to say, not happy-go-lucky, but you enjoy going to work yeah. kind of places. When I, when I read about like uh, the sort of discipline of television production, a lot of times um, there are producers like Roy Huggins who primarily would be like, as a producer was primarily kind of a writer. A lot of television producers are primarily kind of writers and they will take other scripts and they'll do the rewrites on them. And, and they're ultimately kind of doing that. It seems like with Aaron Spelling from everything I can tell is he was sort of a facilitator who was kind of creating a safe space 
um, at, at least at this point in his career, for others to do really good work. Um, mm -hmm. Because sometimes you need uh, somebody to run interference for you so that you can do your best work. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, And it does like look that. like that Aaron Spelling was kind of that kind of guy, even though he was a, a very capable writer, um, particularly from the early days. Like, I, I don't think that he was like the kind of uh, like a Roy Huggins type who was um, on top of that stuff to the point of uh, driving everybody crazy. <laughs> you know? No, no. The best I can tell is, oh, I mean, it's interesting because like we're jumping ahead. But if you think about like uh, Shannon Doherty, uh, who I love, but you know, she was uh, had a really bad reputation on 90210, but yet he brought her back for Charmed. You mm -hmm. know, like he could just work with all different types of people too. So when you talk about that safe space, I think that's a really good way to put that. He created environments. So even when people were like, there was trauma or trauma, drama on the sets, uh, and maybe trauma, who knows, but, <laughs> um, but he could work through it, and he somehow was able to connect with these people even when it wouldn't seem anybody could connect with them. You know what yeah, I mean? And he yeah. ended up having a really interesting relationship with Shannon Doherty, you know, because yeah. of it. Um, and, and we're going to, as this series goes on, we're going to get into, we're going to move forward. And I don't know if we'll quite get to Charmed or Seventh Heaven, the last shows that he did, but we will talk a little bit about how he formed the sort of WB okay. um, aesthetic uh, in a couple of his uh, earlier shows. But the next one that we're going to do, which will be the last uh, Monday on uh, in March, uh, we will do Charlie's Angels. So that is a really big show. We're not going to double it up with another show. We're just going to do two Charlie's Angels episodes because there's so much to be said about it. it is, um, it's the show I think that Aaron Spelling is most identified with probably, um, even though he had probably other shows were even bigger hits and lasted longer. Maybe not, but um, mm, well, maybe Charlie's Dynasty. Angels. Oh, yeah, I'd have to think about that. Yeah, yeah. Dynasty was probably a bigger hit. Um, maybe even Love Boat, which lasted more seasons. Oh, yeah, it lasted maybe. 10 seasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so Charlie's Angels is is the maybe the key text uh, in, the, in the study of Aaron Spelling. It certainly has, it opens up um, a lot of, um, uh, we're, we're able to kind of look at his work through that prism, I think. Yeah, I mean, that, and also of all the shows that he's done, that's the one that everybody keeps trying to, to replicate, and they yeah. can't yeah. because he got it right, and you can't fix what's not broken. And we'll talk about that when it happens. But, yeah, uh, that's the legacy show yeah. for him, I think. And we'll talk about how he, how he produced. At that point, he's working with Lynn Goldberg. It was Lynn Goldberg on that, yeah. I think so. Uh, and, and how they were kind of working together and doing all this. And um, I'm really eager for people to see Charlie's Angels because I think people know the show. They've seen clips from the show. But um, until you actually sort of watch it, uh, you probably don't. Um, it's hard to kind of get what it does um, and what's going on in the course of those shows and the, the, these women sort of supporting each other. Um, and that's really a big part of what that show is about. Oh, my God. There's so many things I already want to say. So I'm going to hold yeah. off. <laughs> and we're going to talk a lot about Jacqueline Smith's hair. Jacqueline Smith's uh, wonder, amazing, wonderful hair. Yes. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll talk a little bit about because I think we'll do one with uh, Farah probably yeah. I think and then we'll do one with uh, uh, Cheryl Ladd and we'll we'll talk about that and um, we'll we'll be talking a little bit about how uh, incredibly popular uh, Farrah Fawcett became as well. So oh yeah, was, absolutely. That was an enormous social phenomenon, the Farrah phenomenon. Um, but I think that's all we got. And it's uh, by the clock on the wall. I see that it's just about time for us to wrap it up. So um, where can people read your your scholarship? Oh my goodness. Well, I think the best thing to do is to follow me on social media mm -hmm. because I have so many things coming out and I don't really update. I had a blog. I have it it's still live, but I don't really touch it. Um, so I'm at Made for TV Mayhem, I think on Twitter. And then you just look up Made for TV Mayhem on Facebook mm -hmm. and my Facebook page should come up. And that's probably the best place to look at what I'm doing. And you are a member of the commentariat, um, creating uh Blu-ray commentaries, I think, uh, a good number of those. A lot of them. I can't yeah. even remember. But we're on a set together. We did uh, the Primetime Panic set. Uh -huh. And uh, I did Freedom. And then there's one on there called Dreams Don't Die. And you did Girls of the White Orchid. Did mm -hmm. I get the title right? Yeah, Death Ride to Osaka. Is yeah, that's a crazy yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a crazy movie. That's a nuts movie. And I didn't know that there wasn't much information about made-for-TV made movies when I agreed to do that commentary. <laughs> and I drove myself. I, I spent probably... 50 hours researching that stuff you know it's it's really hard i uh was able to find stuff on freedom i think because it was based on a true story yeah, yeah. And, uh, and from a famous family but yeah, yeah. there was more about it so yeah. i got a little lucky with that one yeah yeah and, and yeah there was a little bit more information about that i think because it was so beloved it was a, a family affair 
So uh, that's all we got. We're going to wrap it up, and now we'll probably go to some sort of blank screen or something until the 9 o'clock show begins. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for joining us, um, theoretically, assuming maybe somebody joined us. I don't know. Um, <laughs> And Amanda, I want to thank you so much for uh, making this whole thing possible. Oh, no, thank you. I, I love doing this. Yeah, it's great to talk about TV. Yay. It's the best. Thanks, everybody. So long. We're thank just going to wave until we fade out.